Victorian. The noble lady was a tub of a ship, as fat and wallowing as the noble ladies of the Greenlands. Her holds were huge, and Victorian packed them with armed men. With her would sail the other lesser prizes that the Iron Fleet had taken on its long voyage to Slaver's Bay, a lubbery assortment of cogs, great cogs, carracks, and trading galleys, salted here and there with fishing boats. It was a fleet both fat and feeble, promising much in the way of wool and wines and other trade goods, and little in the way of danger. Victorian gave the command of it to Wolf One Ear. The slavers may shiver when they spy your sails rising from the sea, he told him, but once they see you plain, they will laugh at their fears. Traitors and fishers, that's all you are. Any man can see that. Let them get close as they like, but keep your men hidden below ducks until you are ready. Then close and board them. Free the slaves and feed the slavers to the sea, but take the ships. We will have need of every hull to carry us back home. Home, Wolf grinned. The men will like the sound of that, Lord Captain. The ships first. Then we break these Junkish men. Aye. The Iron Victory was lashed alongside the noble lady. The two ships bound tight with chains and grappling hooks. A ladder stretched between them. The great cog was much larger than the warship and sat higher in the water. All along the gun walls, the faces of the Ironborn peered down, watching as Victorian clapped Wolf One Air on the shoulder and sent him clambering up the ladder. The sea was smooth and still, the sky bright with stars. Wolf ordered the ladder drawn up, the chains cast off. The warship and the cog parted ways. In the distance, the rest of Victorian's feigned fleet was raising sail. A ragged cheer went up from the crew of the Iron Victory and was answered in kind by the men of the noble lady. Victorian had given Wolf his best fighters. He envied them. They would be the first to strike a blow, the first to see that look of fear in the foeman's eyes. As he stood at the prow of the Iron Victory, watching one ear's merchant ships vanish one by one into the west, the faces of the first foe he'd ever slain came back to Victorian Greyjoy. He thought of his first ship, of his first woman. A restlessness was in him, a hunger for the dawn and the things this day would bring. Death or glory, I will drink my fill of both today. The sea stone chair should have been his when Balin died, but his brother Euron had stolen it from him, just as he had stolen his wife many years before. He stole her and he soiled her, but he left it for me to slay her. All that was done and gone now, though. Victorian would have his due at last. I have the horn, and soon I will have the woman, a woman lovelier than the wife he made me kill. Captain, the voice belonged to Longwater Pike. The oarsmen await your pleasure, three of them, and strong ones. Send them to my cabin. I want the priest as well. The oarsmen were all big. One was a boy, one a brute, one a bastard's bastard. The boy had been rowing for less than a year, the brute for twenty. They had names, but Vic Farian did not know them. One had come from Lamentation, one from Sparrowhawk, one from Spiderkiss. He could not be expected to know the names of every thrall who had ever pulled an oar in the Iron Fleet. Show them the horn, he commanded, when the three had been ushered into his cabin. Mokoro brought it forth, and the dusky woman lifted up a lantern to give them all a look. In the shifting lantern light, the hell horn seemed to writhe and turn in the priest's hands like a serpent fighting to escape. Makoro was a man of monstrous size, big-bellied, broad-shouldered, towering, but even in his grasp the horn looked huge. My brother found this thing on Valeria, Victorian told the thralls. Think how big the dragon must have been to bear two of these upon his head. Bigger than Vagar or Maroxes. Bigger than Balarion, the Black Dread. He took the horn from Makoro and ran his palm along its curves. At the king's moot on Old Wick, one of Euron's mutes blew upon this horn. Some of you will remember. It was not a sound that any man who heard it will ever forget. They say he died, the boy said, him who blew the horn. Aye. The horn was smoking after. The mute had blisters on his lips, and the bird inked across his chest was bleeding. He died the next day. When they cut him open, his lungs were black. The horn is cursed, said the bastard's bastard. A dragon's horn from Valeria, said Victorian. Aye, it's cursed. I never said it wasn't. 
He brushed his hand across one of the red gold bands, and the ancient glyph seemed to sing beneath his fingertips. For half a heartbeat, he wanted nothing so much as to sound the horn himself. Joran was a fool to give me this. It is a precious thing and powerful. With this, I'll win the sea stone chair and then the iron throne. With this, I'll win the world. Claghorn blew the horn thrice and died for it. He was as big as any of you and strong as me. So strong that he could twist a man's head right off his shoulders with only his bare hands, and yet the horn killed him. It will kill us too, then, said the boy. Victorian did not oft forgive a thrall for talking out of turn, but the boy was young, no more than twenty, and soon to die besides. He let it pass. The mute sounded the horn three times. You three will sound it only once. Might be you'll die, might be you won't. All men die. The Iron Fleet is sailing into battle. Many on this very ship will be dead before the sun goes down, stabbed or slashed, gutted, drowned, burned alive. Only the gods know which of us will still be here come the morrow. Sound the horn and live, and I'll make free men of you, one or two or all three. I'll give you wives, a bit of land, a ship to sail, thralls of your own. Men will know your names. Even you, Lord Captain, asked the bastard's bastard. Aye. I'll do it then. And me, said the boy. The brute crossed his arms and nodded. If it made the three feel braver to believe they had a choice, let them cling to that. Victorian kid little what they believed. They were only thralls. You will sail with me on iron victory, he told them, but you will not join the battle. Boy, you're the youngest. You'll sound the horn first. When the time comes, you will blow it long and loud. They say you're strong. Blow the horn until you are too weak to stand, until the last bit of breath has been squeezed from you, until your lungs are burning. Let the freedmen hear you in Marine, the slavers in Yunkai, the ghosts in Astapur. Let the monkeys shit themselves at the sound when it rolls across the Isle of Cedars. Then pass the horn along to the next man. Do you hear me? Do you know what to do? The boy and the bastard bastards tug their forelocks. The brute might have done the same, but he was bold. You may touch the horn, then go. They left him one by one, the three thralls, and then Makoto. Victorian would not let him take the hell horn. I will keep it here with me until it's needed. As you command, would you have me bleed you? Victorian seized the dusky woman by the wrist and pulled her to him. She will do it. Go pray to your red god. Light your fire and tell me what you see. Makoto's dark eyes seemed to shine. I see dragons. The dusky woman went to her knees once the priest was gone. She brushed aside her salty hair and looked up at Victarion, the offer of a dagger in her outstretched hand. It was one of his. Victarion never saw where she took it from. His scorched palm fell, dangling just above the woman's breasts. No sign of Ceres' cut could be read there in the rutted flesh, but the pain was proof it hadn't healed after all the priest had done. His magic weakens. This fire god flickers in the wind. Or perhaps where lore requires sacrifices. I'll give him those soon enough. The dagger traced a line over charred skin. Victarion felt nothing. He stood rigid and watched a puff of smoke rise out of the cut. It smelled of ash and rotten eggs. Then blood welled up dark and thick in his palm, oozed out between his fingers and dripped into the stone bowl held by the dusky woman. Some splattered onto the cabin floor. In a moment of madness, Victarion thought he saw the red droplets writhing and squirming between the boards like fleeing roaches. He shuddered. She was looking at him, eyes as black as ink. He yanked the bowl away from her with his unburnt hand and turned to face the hellhorn. His reflection stared back at him, warped and curving in the onyx gleam. The glyphs of red gold glittered over his bent image. Soon they would scream, glowing red hot and then white as the horn sucked up a life's breath. Blood for fire and fire for blood. Victarion poured the blood, his blood, over the runes and let it drip down the cursed thing's side. He dropped the empty bowl. His blood would claim the horn, Makaro said. Was it done? He had to be sure. The dusky woman gave a start of fear as the iron captain clapped his bloody palm onto the dragonhorn's surface. It was hot to the touch. 
When he embraced his dragon queen, would her skin be like the horn? So smooth and so hot. Grimacing, he pushed his hand forward slowly, then back, painting the thick horn red all round. Through the pain, he could feel his hand grow stronger even as he rubbed, his grip more firm. With steady strokes, he covered the bands, red gold and black Valyrian steel alike. My horn, he murmured. Up and down its smooth contours, it bore his blood, his claim. My horn. Brimming with desire, he whispered, My dragons. When at last he removed his hand, viscous strands stretched out between him and his horn. It's done, he said. It has a new master. He looked down at the dusky woman, still kneeling before him. And so do you. Victarion reached her with one stride and wrapped his bloody hand around her neck. The first sacrifice, he wondered, enjoying the new strength in his fingers. Euron's gifts are poisoned. Her eyes went wide, just as his wife's had. His manhood stirred. No, I will keep you. His grip loosened. Blood dripped from her neck, down between her breasts. Her smile was now calm, passive, but she could not disguise the quickening of her breath. Open your legs. She disrobed and lay down. Her moon's blood was on her. A drop of red fell onto the boards beneath her, next to his own. The damp hair warned men to avoid women at this time, claiming they were unclean. When is a woman ever clean? Victarion had always found the blood arousing. The smell reminded him of battle. He knelt between her legs. Her little mate had emerged from beneath her boat's sail, rosy-faced. Long ago... When the old way ruled the Iron Isles, fathers would hack that bit off their daughters, lest the girls grow lustful and dishonor their kin. Amongst the Greenlanders, men were known to lick the boy, the way a dog greets its master. The thought turned Victarion's stomach. His charred forefinger pushed inside, and her lips parted, slick with blood. When he twisted sharply, the woman squirmed. He added a finger, then one more. She tried to pull away. No, he commanded. He grabbed her waist and pulled her close. His whole hand was inside her, and only then did he clench it into a fist. Rivulets of blood flowed through the furrows of his blackened wrist, red and black and smoking. If she'd had a tongue, she would have screamed. His manhood was a bowsprit. It had not been this hard since he was a boy. Victorian Greyjoy wanted nothing more than to take the woman then and there. He would show her, make her see, make her obey. She would know a true king. All of them would. His dragon queen, his brazen niece, the Greenland ladies with their plump bodies and their powdered faces, their husbands too, weak men, soft, never knowing pain. He would beat the smile off the boy king, squeeze Stannis Baratheon's neck until his face went purple, and the crow's eye. The things he would do to him. Victarion knew better than to unship his oar. He would not crest the wave and spend his vigor on this wench just before the fighting began. Only fools fucked before battle. The salt of a man's seed is the salt of the sea, Tarl the Thrice Drowned would often say. And the sea is power. He was done with her. She lay there shuddering, unclothed. But it was Victarion who felt naked. My halberk, he commanded. Be quick. When she was able, she rose and went to fetch it. A trail of blood followed her. His or hers, he could not have said. He stood and wiped his hand clean upon the hellhorn, admiring again its golden runes. The dusky woman returned with his armor. Victarion let out a grunt as he slipped into the chainmail. It was comforting to feel the steel upon his body. Better than a cunt, he told himself. He had her bring him his polians, coders, and greaves, savoring the fit of each piece. Then there were a few things he let the woman help him with. The gorget she put around his neck, buckling it deftly. After that, her hand slid down to the strap between his breastplate and backplate and pulled it tight. She'd done this before. What dead man did you help dress? he asked. Was it the slaver Euron took her from? 
someone the slaver had killed? How many times had this woman passed from one man to another? He didn't know why he thought of it. It made no difference. She was no one. A bedwarmer. Are you from Nath? The Summer Islands? The dusky woman only smiled. If Victarion didn't kill her, the woman might see her home again some day soon. Heading back west near Valyria was far too perilous now, with the Valentine fleet sailing to Slaver's Bay. But swinging south to the Corsair's road along Sotheros might serve. Mayhaps they would find Red Ralph Stonehouse and his men living among the savages. Victarion would need all the ships he could get to face the crow's eye. The helm was last. Victarion sat as she lowered it onto his head. Through the visor of tentacles, the world always looked less solid to him, more changeable, even frail. He felt the cold caress at his throat as the black iron kraken was fastened tight. When he appeared above decks, his crew gathered round. Some of their eyes were wide with panic. Burton Humble, Ragnar Pike, and all his best men had gone with Wolf One Ear. Cowards, this bunch. The battle has not even begun. The dragons fly, yelled Tom Tidewood. The men spotted one in the east. Dragons. The Red Priest had seen them in his flames. Good, said Victorian. They are free to heal before me. B -b before you? asked Stefan Stammerer. He glared. I mean to bind the beasts to my will. The Grey King brought fire to the earth. I will do the same. Then Daenerys can come to me, the beggar, and plead to be my wife. Euron said he would marry the Dragon Queen, said Quellen Humble warily. My brother's words are wind. He says the gods have no power, yet I stand before you, the champion of two. And we will need them both. Fifty thousand Yunkishmen lie before us, and five hundred Valentine warships at our backs. Those wide eyes flitted about exchanging doubtful glances. Enough. Victorian Greyjoy was done with cowardice. I come to lead you into battle, not coddle you like squalling babes. At my bosom, you won't find the mother's milk of heartening words. No, for me salt water flows. I give you the truth. You all know what happens come the morn. We break our fast on battle and on glory. Wolf One Ear will have the first helping, but he's a diversion. While the slavers are trying to tell port from starboard, Grief and a dozen other ships will take the river. The rest of us will make for the western shore. On my signal, you will row and sail faster than you ever have. Our strike will be too swift for the Yunkish armies to respond. Sail behind Iron Wind, Sparrowhawk, and Kraken's Kiss. Their perimeter will await us, but wait before you land. When the dragons are close, I'll bring out the horn. On its third blow, we will come ashore and await our dragons. Then we feast. All day. For all days. From now until the end of time, we feast. I can't say where you'll gorge. Might be beside me and my dragons in the palaces of Marine. Might be in the drowned gods' watery halls when your ashes have washed into the bay. It makes no matter. None of us will ever hunger again. Not with three dragons. Not with the drowned god and the red god smiling upon us both. Longwater Pike began a chant. Three dragons! Two gods! The crew roared and stamped their feet. Three, three dragons, dragons! Two, two gods. gods! One king. A gust of wind blew strong and hard. With it came a plume of salty spray and the cheers of men. Makoro and his robes of flame were flickering behind the dull leather and armor of his crew. My gods are with me, Victarion knew. Let the world beware. Raise the banners, he commanded. Tom Tidewood brought out the new ones he had sewn. Red upon black billowed as they went up the mast. Soon a reaving song broke out amongst the men. It was an old one, sung in rounds to give strength to men awaiting battle. The Iron Men pounded the gunwale as more voices joined in, weapons and armor clanking. It was a queer song, in truth, about a stillborn girl and her father's anguish. His fury. Victorian clenched his fist, thinking of his wives, past and future. Then he began to sing. 
Cold Denel, heresy in so pale. Cold Denel, unfurl my battered sails. Cold Denel, your cry is in their wails. I'll swim the watery halls with Cold Denel. They sang all the way to Marine.